Hey, welcome to our online service. I'm Pastor Manny, this is Pastor Josh, and we're just looking forward to worshiping with you this morning. Hey, before we continue, Pastor Josh, our youth pastor here at Calvary, he has a few words for you. Yeah, hey church, how's it going? My name's Pastor Josh, as Manny said, I'm the youth pastor here at Calvary. I uh, do the middle school and high school ministry. Uh, I, you know, Hopefully I've had a chance to meet you if I haven't yet. Hey, hi, good to meet you. Um, I know what you're thinking. Wow, they're letting the youth pastor do announcements, but I still have a chaperone, so don't worry. I won't go too crazy. Um, but really, we wanted to take a minute, so bear with me. I really wanted to share with you what the Lord's been doing through our youth ministry here at Calvary. Uh, we've actually been meeting in person since last August uh, of 2020, which is crazy. It's almost been a year that we got to come back together and start meeting in person. Uh, it's been a, a crazy season, a lot of, you know, mostly outdoor services when we had the tent, a lot of cold Tuesday nights trying to worship and gather together, but uh, God was just really faithful. Uh, we've been meeting indoors, doing our main, you know, worship time and teachings indoors and, and then kind of separating for our small group time. But I just wanted to share with you as the congregation, uh, the Lord has been doing some amazing things. Uh, he's not only been growing our youth group numerically, but we also just see real fruit as we've developed some student leadership teams and our my, my volunteer young adult team that, that runs the small groups has grown. And it's just been an, a really crazy yet fun season. And so with that, um, kind of as the end of the 2021 school year, you know, kind of comes to an end, uh, we're looking forward to summer and just kind of all that God has for that. And so I wanted to share with you just some of those announcements some of the things that's coming that are coming up. Um, the first one is this is for all you parents that are currently in youth ministry or your kids are, and the kind of upcoming sixth grade parents. Uh, all all you parents who have these little fifth graders that are graduating and about ready to enter into to the youth group era and that that kind of time. Uh, this Tuesday coming up, uh, May 25th, we're having an intro to youth ministry night where I want to invite every one of you parents to come out and enjoy a, a burger dinner with myself, my leaders, and the students. So yeah, you and your students are invited. Um, we're gonna kind of hang out, have some presentation, uh, just kind of make sure that we're, we're all on the same page. I wanna share with you the vision. And then you parents are actually gonna go into small groups, not with your students, but you're gonna go into small groups with their small group leaders and get to know these young adults that are pouring into and loving on your students week after week. And so that's this Tuesday, May 25th. Um, I know the date's probably down there on the, the TV or something like that, but anyway, I hope to see you there. Um, another one I wanna introduce or like invite you to, uh, your students to, uh, our high schoolers. That sounded weird. Okay, um, <laughs> I wanna invite um, our current high schoolers to is our prom coming up uh, on June 4th. Um, yeah, it's, it's gonna be like a formal prom. We're calling it the prom-demic just to kinda celebrate the end of a really crazy year. Uh, but I want to just kind of invite all the current high schoolers, if they have any friends that want to come, we're going to be doing that here on June 4th. Um, and I want to actually ask you parents for help. Uh, I need help decorating Sanctuary 2 for this prom. I need help with uh, kind of the finger foods and desserts and that kind of thing. So I want to put that invitation out to you parents for that, that event on June 4th, our prom-demic. Uh, any of you parents that want to be involved, please come talk to me and, uh, or email me at joshuas at calvary.com and all that good stuff. Um, really last one and our big kind of kicker for the summer parents is uh, our summer camps. You know, I, as I've gotten to do this ministry and gotten to be a youth pastor for all these years, the fact is one of the, the just the high points of youth ministry is the camps that we get to do. Um, I'm, maybe even some of you have memories and thoughts and just like fond, just, just points in your life where Jesus talked to, you know, spoke to you and led you. And maybe those moments were at camp. And so, you know, if you look, at uh, you know, calvary.com slash events, you're gonna see our both our high school and our middle school camp. Uh, I'd like to invite your students to come and be a part of that. If they, you haven't registered yet, please go register. Uh, and also there's some need for scholarships. So if anyone seeing this just has a heart and is just feeling that pull to help sponsor a student to go to camp, uh, please let me know and, and let the church know about that. You can give online through that also. So really with that church, my last kind of, kind of ploy for you for the youth ministry is we are growing and we need volunteers. And so I'm just gonna throw that out there that if any of you seeing this, uh, just kind of have, again, that pull, that heart to wanna be involved with the youth ministry, um, come talk to me, uh, find me out, email me, and uh, I'd love to chat with you about possibly joining the youth ministry team and helping out just because we, we are in a place where we're growing and, and we just need more workers. So anyway, church, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for letting the youth pastor have a moment of your time. Thanks for chaperoning Manny. And um, 
Yeah, so anyway, Church, thanks. Well, thank you so much for that update, Josh. There's uh, some exciting things happening and you know, it really gives us a great opportunity to remember our young people in our prayers, our youth pastor in our prayers. Some great things are happening. As a former youth pastor, I remember these life-changing opportunities. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. So why don't we take a moment and pray. Father, we thank you so much for what you're doing in the lives of our young people. Thank you for the vision that you've given Pastor Josh, Lord, the energy that you've given him, Lord. We pray that you would continue, Lord, to provide what he needs, Lord, to love and care for the spiritual needs of, of our young people. God, we pray for these events that are coming forward, that are gonna be happening in the near future, that you would go before us, Lord, that you'd begin to prepare students' hearts and minds, Lord, to receive from you, Lord, what you have for them in this uh, really strategic time in their life. And so, Father, be glorified, be honored, accomplish your purposes and plan through these things, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Let's sing this together. Before, before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. The great high priest whose name is love Whoever lives and pleads for me My name is graven on his hands My name is written on his heart I know that while in heaven he stands No tongue can bid me thence depart No tongue can bid me thence depart Satan tempts me to despair And tells me of the guilt within Upward I look and see him there Who made an end to all my sins Because the sinless Savior died My sinful soul is counted free For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me To look on him and pardon me Behold him there, the risen lamb My perfect spotless righteousness The great unchangeable I am The king of glory of grace one with himself I cannot die my soul is purchased by his blood my life is hid with Christ on high with Christ my Savior and my God with Christ my Savior and my God the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free, for God the just is satisfied, to look on Him and pardon me, to look on Him and pardon me.
forever let your church proclaim Christ is risen from the dead trampling over death by death come awake come awake come and rise up from the grave Christ is risen from the dead we are one with him again come awake come awake come and rise up from the grave beneath beneath the weight of all our shame you bow to none but heaven's will no scheme of hell no scoffer's crown no burden great can hold you down cause in strength you reign forever let your church proclaim christ is risen christ is risen from the dead trampling over death by death come awake come awake come and rise up from the grave christ is risen from the dead we are one with him again Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, hell, where is your victory? And oh, church, come stand in the light. The glory of God has defeated. The night we're singing, oh death, where is your sting? Oh hell, where is your victory? And oh church, come stand in the light. Our God is not dead, he's alive. Christ is risen from the dead. Trampling over death by death Come awake, come awake Come and rise up from the grave Christ is risen from the dead We are one with Him again Come awake, come awake Come and rise up from the grave Christ is risen from the dead Trampling over death by death Come awake, come awake Come and rise up from the grave Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with Him again. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Wake up from the grave. Hey church, this is Pastor Manny, and now we get the opportunity to worship the Lord in our giving. Remember all the different ways that we have to give here at Calvary. You can give online at calvary.com forward slash give. You can text any amount to the, this, this number, 84321. So easy to remember. Um, you can also mail it in person. You can find our address online. Or even if you happen to show up here, we have various boxes on Sunday morning as well as in the main worship center where you can drop that off. And the, way we, the reason why we have so many different ways to make it so easy for you to give isn't because we need it or because God needs it. Well, we do need it, but, or because God needs it. He doesn't. The reason why we make it so easy is because we are the ones that need the habit, need this discipline of generosity. He's been so generous to us. That is where it comes from. And so in a few minutes, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer uh, for our offering as well. But before we continue, I wanted to read Psalm 1 to you. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree 
planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither in all that he does. He prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we thank you so much for this example of this man that we know as the blessed man. He is the one, Lord God, that we can look to and see what it looks like, what it means to be blessed. But who is he really? This blessed man is Jesus. Jesus is the supreme example of blessing. It's when we follow his counsel, when we follow his way, that we find true blessing. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us to delight in Jesus, to meditate upon him. Lord, those are the things that make us people that are planted, productive, that help us to persevere. Lord, this is the kind of man who prospers. And we find all those blessings in Jesus and in the gospel. And so, Lord, we thank you that you also have put in us this desire, this ability to be generous. We pray, Lord God, as we consider our gifts this, this morning or whenever it is that we're listening to this message, that you'd fill our hearts, Lord God, with generosity and gratitude for what you have been to us and what you mean to us. And that in response, Lord God, we would take this token, this portion of what you've given to us and give it to you, Lord, with gratitude, with thanksgiving, Lord. Thank you, God, for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. There is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder, show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around. Worthy of every song we could ever sing, sing worthy. worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We sing Jesus Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Yes, we do. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love. 
to those around me I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation All right, church, great to be with you this Lord's Day. And today we're going to continue our study in 1 Peter. If you turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, we're going to look at verse 13 through 16 together uh, as we consider the exilic Christian life. Peter wrote to this group of believers in modern day Turkey and considered them exiles for Jesus, exiles for the faith, beginning to live on the fringes of of their society, he wanted to instruct them on an exile kind of Christianity. And I believe that First Peter is greatly instructive for us in our modern era, so I've been wanting to go slowly through this letter so that we can glean from it everything the Spirit has for us so that we could learn how to live the exilic Christian life together. Our text today, like I said, First Peter chapter 1, verse 13 and following. Peter said, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Father, we thank you as the holy God that you have invited us into a holy life. We pray that we might have the mentality that you want us to have for this exile that you've called us to as your people. We thank you, Lord, and pray now that by your spirit you teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Uh, well, many of you know that in my 30s, I enjoyed the sport of endurance trail running. I, I was never a very fast person, never a threat to win a race, but I did like to sign up for small local races as a way to challenge myself and set goals and work towards those goals. And a one race in particular stands out. It was around the perimeter of the Folsom Dam in Northern California at the end of winter. It was wet, it was winding. Within the first half mile, we had to run through a river. It was just a long and miserable day. Uh, but the finish of that race was absolutely epic. After 31 miles of trails, the race ended at a picnic area. Now, these races are usually very small, and because of that, the racers often finish the race totally alone. Sometimes nobody even notices that you cross the finish line, but this race did it differently. They organized a way to spot each runner's bib number as they approached the finish line. So as I was running towards the finish, they spotted my number and turned on the sound system and announced to everyone gathered there, my city and my name from Monterey, California, Nate Holdridge and the crowd, which basically consisted of other racers who had beaten me, who were now eating barbecue around the finish line. They all turned and they cheered and they celebrated me as I crossed the line. And I will admit it was a pretty good feeling to be recognized in that way. Now, in our passage today, Peter is going to tell us of the mentality that the exile Christian life requires. I want to call it the exile mentality. And I find that it compares nicely to the mindset needed for endurance sports. First, it requires a well-placed hope on the finish line. You're not going to train right. You're not going to eat right. And you're not going to run the actual race well if you don't have a vision for the end. And you won't live an exilic form of Christianity without placing your hope fully on the grace that is to be revealed when Jesus comes. Second, it requires living life differently. You see, endurance athletes, they are a different breed often misunderstood by the general population. You know, why would you want to run 20 miles on Saturday mornings for your training? Why is that enjoyable? Why do you like to suffer? Now, I'm not here to justify those decisions or try to explain them to you, but I just am trying to point out, it takes a different kind of lifestyle. Nutrition, sleep, free time, they're all affected by the commitment to run the race. And you won't make it far in the exilic Christian life without being different. Peter calls it holiness in the passage today. So today, from this text, let's consider the exile mentality. It makes two statements. Number one is this, I will hope well. That's the exile mentality. I will hope well. And number two, I will pursue holiness. I will pursue holiness. So let's look at the first of these two points. The first statement the exile mentality makes is, I will hope well. And I take this from the first verse of our text, verse 13. Peter said, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, this is a transitional statement for Peter. After writing a lot in the first 12 verses about our glorious future salvation, he's about to deliver a truckload of exhortations to the church. I mean, the rest of 1 Peter is one of the most exhortative passages in all of Scripture. But Peter knows that we have to set our hopes firmly on Jesus and the grace that he's going to bring with him when he returns, if we're going to live this kind of life that he's about to exhort us to live. If we don't think, dream, look forward to, and anticipate the marvelous grace of his forever kingdom, we will flail when the pressures of exilic Christianity press upon us. 
We need to place our hope fully on Jesus' coming. And I want you to notice how Peter begins this exhortation to set our hope on the grace of Jesus' coming with the word therefore in verse 13. This means that after everything that Peter has told us so far about our living hope, there is an appropriate response. There is something we should do in response. And what we must do is set our hope fully on the grace that is coming with Jesus. And I just want to let this phrase sink in. The exile mentality is able to say, I am, as a Christian, I am involved. I have to get my hope in the right place. I'm being asked told here by Peter, the apostle, to set my vision correctly. I'm not just a passive passenger on the ride of life. I must actively, daily engage myself in putting my hope where it belongs, on the grace that is coming when Jesus returns. You see, much of life, especially life as a Christian exile, works together to get you off of this eternal perspective. We get distracted, we get discouraged, we get tempted, we get sinful. Or to put it in the terms we framed in this letter, we want to angrily fight our society, we want to retreat and fear from our society, or we want to give in and conform to our society. But instead, we must repeatedly come back to the strong acknowledgement that there's more to life and set our hope fully on the coming grace of the kingdom of Jesus. And I love how Peter describes that future state. It's beautiful to me. He says, the grace that will be brought to you. The reason why it's beautiful to me is because the Bible often speaks of Jesus' future kingdom as something glorious, as glory, not grace. But that's how Peter describes it here. He sings of it as grace, which means favor or privilege or a gift. Now, it's going to be both, of course. It's going to be glorious. Jesus' forever kingdom is going to be filled with glory. There's going to be no unrighteousness, no injustice, no pain, no suffering, human flourishing, beautiful community, innate joy. It will be glorious. But through it all, forever and ever, we will be conscious that it is all Grace, it's all of grace. We will always be impressed that God decided to give us such an elaborate, timeless, never-ending, always unfolding, freshly discovered gift. And I like it that Peter says, this grace, it will be brought to you in verse 13. In other words, in Peter's mind, this coming grace of Jesus' kingdom, it is on its way. Like the light from a distant star, which takes years to get to planet earth. So the grace of Jesus is coming. It is on its way. It might seem like it's taken a long time, but it will most certainly arrive. All right, but Peter here was not content to just tell us that we should set our hope fully on the grace coming with Jesus. Instead, because Peter knew how pivotal, how important this attitude was, he took the time to show us how to set our hope on Christ. So we are saying, I want to set my hope in the right direction. I want to hope well, but how do I do that? Well, look at the beginning of verse 13. Peter said, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded. Okay, let's consider both of those things, con- c- preparing our minds for action and, secondly, being sober-minded. See, the thing is, if you want to hope well, to set your hope on the grace coming with Jesus, you have to prepare your mind for action. The image that Peter uses in this phrase comes from his society. Actually, literally, he didn't say prepare your mind for action. Literally, he said, gird up the loins of your mind. It's just modern translators think We're not going to understand what Peter meant when he said, gird up the loins of your mind. What does that mean? You see, in Peter's day, people wore robes, and so when they would run 
or work or exert themselves, they would take the bottom parts of their robes and they would tie them up into their belt around their waist. This would enable them to move more swiftly. They would gird up their robes. So Peter knows that we cannot expect our minds to naturally drift towards the grace that is coming towards us when Jesus comes. We need to, in other words, in Peter's mind, reverse engineer our lives from eternity's viewpoint. What is important forever is what we should be about today, and it takes mental discipline to be about that. But there's a lot of distractions for this mentality or this hope to just occur naturally. Instead, we have to prepare our minds for action. We must continually plot and plan and pursue this eternal hope. We must conceive of ways to refocus our minds on the all-important grace coming with Jesus. This is, in a sense, Peter's way of saying, don't have a lazy mind. You know, Jesus said in Mark chapter 12, which we studied a few months ago together as a church, that we're to love God with, our, with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We're to put on the right mentality. Peter knows that if we don't, we won't live the true, exilic Christian life. Stop me if you've heard this one before, but how do you know that somebody does CrossFit? Well, they'll tell you. <laughs> they'll definitely tell you. Now, I want you to imagine a CrossFit box. That's what CrossFitters call their gym. And, and, and imagine at the designated hour, it's time to work out. You know, people park their cars, they're walking up to the building, and pretty soon the, the CrossFit session begins. Now, what are you imagining in your mind right now? I'm sure you're thinking about men and women that are dressed appropriately for the physical suffering that they are about to endure. You're not imagining people in business suits right now. You're not imagining people in flip-flops and Hawaiian t-shirts. No, Every person in your imagination, they, they've got workout gear on. They've got tank tops, shorts, sneakers, spandex. You know, they are ready to roll to exercise hard during that hour. But many of us, we approach the Christian life without any shift of mentality. We just kind of hope it will happen. But discipleship and growth, according to Peter, require a mentality, a plan. We read, we think, we study, we pray, we fast, we exercise our gifts, we train for godliness. This all takes an engaged mentality. Uh, maybe you've been to the gym before when someone walks in who clearly has no plan whatsoever. You know, they're usually pretty sporadic in their efforts. They try every machine. Sometimes they don't even know how machines are meant to be used and they use them in very creative, odd ways. They get to talking to people. They drift about with any discipline. Peter does not want us to be this way. Instead, he tells us that when it comes to the Christian life, we must ready our minds to live in the light of eternity. But he also tells us in verse 13 that we should be sober-minded. Now, this definitely includes just simple sobriety. You know, Christians should not allow their minds to be recreationally clouded by any substance. Now, and if you're struggling with that, we have resources and ministries here at Calvary to help you overcome addictions in your life, including our Monday night regeneration meetings. But Peter here was thinking about more than just physical sobriety. He's addressing a sober mind because he knows physical intoxication is a danger, but so is mental intoxication. How do you become intoxicated in the mind? Well, with a lack of moderation. When we consume too much of something, we lose our sobriety in the area of the mind. Consider your own life, consider your own heart. You know, there are areas and even pleasures of life that are good in their proper place, but when enjoyed beyond moderation, they can deaden your senses towards the grace that is coming with Jesus. So you just have to pray about it for your own life. It could be too much entertainment that is intoxicating your mind, causing you to lose focus. It could be too much news. It could be that you're reading or listening or watching too many of the current events of the day and you're losing your interest in Christ. It could be too much fashion, 
for you. That's too much of a mentality. You're thinking often about what you're going to wear and shopping and all of that. Could be too much exercise, too much work, too much home improvement, too much wealth accumulation, too much family time. These are, many of them, good things that should never turn into God things. And without moderation, they can all cloud our vision of Jesus, replacing our hope in his coming with distraction and discouragement or disappointment. So the exile is determined to place their hope in the right place. We say, I will place my hope well. And with discipline, we reorient our lives around this great hope. That's the first thing that this passage shows us. The second uh, is this. The second part of an exile mentality is this. We would say, I will pursue holiness. I will pursue holiness. Now this comes in verse 14 through 16. Paul, Peter said, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it's written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Now, I just want to say this. The holy life, we have to make this confession. It is a beautiful life. And when I say that, I recognize that for a lot of people, the word beauty is not really the word that they would attach to the word holy. But don't buy into the lie about holiness. You know, Satan has been whispering into the ears of the sons and daughters of Eve for thousands of years now, telling us that God is keeping good things from us. He tells us that if we eat the forbidden fruit, we will find life and our eyes will be opened. Okay, but, but the holy life, it's a better life, better than anything that he could offer. It's beautiful because God designed this life for us. He designed how we should live. And the distinction that God is our designer and therefore the one that we should follow, that's an an important shift that exilic Christians must make. And the reason that I say shift is because it's clear that right now we're living in the age of the dominance of the inner person. In, In other words, what a person feels a person's impulses, a person's inner drives, those drives and desires and passions have become the most important identifiers of who we are to our current society. We are, as one philosopher said, living in the age of the psychological man, where desires inwardly define who we are. But the exilic Christian life turns from within to God above. God becomes the standard. That's what Peter's trying to show us in this brief passage. He said that we should be holy in all our conduct because God is holy. He even quoted Leviticus to make the point. There God said, you shall be holy for I am holy. So what is Peter saying? He's saying that God is the new standard that we are to submit to. Not our inner person, not our desires, not our drives. Contrary to popular opinion, we aren't just a bucket of desires that society has somehow oppressed. Our mission isn't to buck societal norms in an attempt to be and live our true selves. That's actually just a mission that makes us like the rest of society. Instead, God's holiness is our pursuit as his people. And this pursuit definitely will make you different. You just can't live the exilic Christian life without this understanding. You will be a different kind of person than the rest of your society. You know, recently I officiated a a really beautiful wedding on the beach in uh, in Carmel. It was a real small gathering. And the thing that made it beautiful was the couple that I got to marry that day. Uh, The man was a student at the Defense Language Institute here in town, and he was a serious Jesus guy, real lover of Christ, uh, part of Calvary while he was here studying in Monterey. And the the woman that he ended up marrying, um, she'd actually been a student of mine during a brief block class that I'd taught a few years ago at my old Bible college. Uh, And they had actually met online. 
And when he moved to Monterey, she encouraged him to come to our church, and he did. He became a great part of it. And part of the reason that it was an honor to officiate their wedding was because they had clearly adopted a different ethic than the world system that they live in. You know, what society would tell them, I mean, here you have these two people, clearly they love each other, they're attracted to each other. And they live in a society that would tell them, you have desires, you're attracted to one another, and we as a society have created ways for you to enjoy those physical pleasures without the responsibility of having a family. So go for it, be your true self. That thing that's inside of you, be your true self. But they decided not to do that. They instead committed themselves to a holy God and they regarded God as their designer. He would tell them what their true self actually was. And what they discovered about him in his word is that he created the gift of sex as a glue that would help bind them together after they'd made a lifelong commitment to one another. They saw it as a holy act designed by a holy God. And they looked to him to define when they could enjoy each other physically. And I use this example just to highlight the beautiful shift that at some point in their lives occurred inside of them. They began to let God define holiness, what is good, what is right, what is true. They let God decide that for them. And part of this pursuit of holiness, Peter said in verse 14, is that we would reject our passions. Peter said in verse 14, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. I really like that Peter said this. It gives us a lot of grace because it helps us understand that he knew that for current Christians, these passions still rage within us. I mean, he's writing to a group of Christians And he tells them, hey, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Those passions are there. They exist. But don't be conformed to those passions. Now, a lot of times, this is a slow and painful process in the Christian life. And for this process, we need God's grace and we need God's mercy. And fortunately, his mercy, his compassion, it is new for us every single morning. But why does Peter tell his audience to avoid their old life's passions? You know, on the one hand, it just sounds like any standard Christian exhortation. But on the other hand, think about this. These were exile Christians. And I think when you're on the fringes of society for your faith, sometimes life gets a little testy. You know, you might get discouraged. You might feel too different from your culture. And sometimes you just feel like you want to break from all the hostility. And it's in those moments that as Christians, we might excuse ourselves if we give in to some of our passions. You know, we'll tell ourselves it's it's just for a little while. You know, maybe even we'll say, I deserve this. Life is really hard. But we mustn't give in to our passions. We must not give ourselves permission to sin. We cannot look back to the old life. We must not be like Lot's wife in Genesis, a woman who looked back fondly on the old life in Sodom, a life which God had clearly judged. Instead, we must keep our gaze forward and on the new life that God has designed for us in Christ. Now, you might be hearing these exhortations from Peter to be holy And you might feel that Peter has given us an impossible mission. You know, how can I be holy like God? How can I pursue holiness? Well, all through the text, Peter gives us a a hint about how to do this. Uh, He reminds us that God has changed us if we're believers uh, because we've been born again and God's spirit is living inside of us. This is why Peter said that we should be holy, verse 14, like God obedient children. We are God's kids, in other words. We've been made new. He's given us a new nature, his nature. He has, verse 15, called us. A new way of living fits our lives because it's our new spiritual DNA. Like Paul said in Ephesians 5, verse 1, 
<clears throat> Therefore, we should be imitators of God as beloved children. The point is that we are God's kids. If you believe in Jesus, you have his holiness deposited into your account. Positionally, before God, you're holy. Now we're to live out the holiness that he has placed inside of us. And I want you to just know that God, he wants to help you on this journey of pursuing a holy life. That's why I've tried to say it this way. An exile mentality says, I will pursue holiness. You know, in one sense, it is already yours. If you're a Christian, you're covered by the blood, and in God's sight, you are holy. But in another sense, we're called to make it our aim, something we want to grow in. We want to grow in practical holiness before God. And with God, we're to learn to live holy lives because it's who we already are. Let's do a little mental exercise here at this point of the teaching. I want to introduce to you uh, in your imagination, imagine that I introduce a child to you. And I've picked an outrageous name for this child. Let's go with Snowfall Ocean Panda Love. That's this kid's name, all right? Now, if you met a kid named Snowfall Ocean Panda Love, you'd be thinking certain things about their parents, wouldn't you? You know, you'd probably get this mental image in their minds. You probably wouldn't be picturing some buttoned up stockbroker, but you'd probably have a, a picture, like for me, I can, I can picture little Snowfall's parents driving down the road in their 1966 Volkswagen bus with the Grateful Dead playing on their sound system and with some kind of smoke emanating from both sides of the vehicle. You know, that might be what you'd imagine with a name of a child like that. Well, listen, if you're in Christ, you have the name of Jesus placed upon you. You are God's child. Born again, you're invited by God into a life of holiness. He wants to help you look more like him. And this is the best life that can be lived. Okay, but I, I want to show you one more thing before I let you go about this life of holiness. It's from this passage. Uh, I want to show you that it's not just that God is inviting you as an individual into a holy life but that he's inviting our whole church community into holy living. You see, the last verse in our passage, verse 16, uh, is a quotation from Leviticus where Peter said, since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Now, I like this quotation um, partly because it comes from Leviticus. You know, right now I'm teaching through the book of Exodus in our Through the Bible Tuesday night teaching series. And uh, we're going to get, we're getting close to actually going through the book of Leviticus together. And I, I love how Peter, in his apostolic position, he interpreted the book of Leviticus for modern Christians. You know, there's a lot that he didn't apply to modern, uh, especially non-Jewish believers. Uh, we don't offer sacrifices and things like that that you find in the book of Leviticus, but he did apply the book of Leviticus to the modern church by saying in Leviticus it says be holy for I am holy. Now what was Leviticus? Well again it wasn't just for individuals it was for a whole nation. God was inviting an entire group of people to live holy lives that would be on display for the nations around them and that's precisely what God is inviting us into today. We're exiles we're different. We've set our hope on the grace that will be ours when Jesus comes again. And we're going to live holy lives, lives on display for all to see. Just like Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, that in the same way we should let our light shine before others so that they may see our good works and give glory to our Father who is in heaven. In other words, we can't be the community we're meant to be without a commitment to holy living together. And holy living cannot be pursued alone. We need the encouragement of the community. So together, let's accept God's invitation to live this holy life. Remember, this is a different kind of life that we are called to live. You know, on Saturday mornings, when everyone else is sleeping in, the, the endurance athletes 
are out there logging mile after mile, making disciplined life decisions, all with the finish line of the next race in their mind's eye. Let's be the same way. A people willing to be holy, to be different, because the grace that will be ours when Jesus arrives is absolutely beautiful. Let's set our minds and our focus there. God bless you, church. I pray that you have a wonderful week.